there's a lot of different types of levers and the levers that we have in like modern society are getting longer and longer. So it used to be that in order to reach a hundred thousand people, you'd have to like collect a ton of people in town halls or visit a hundred towns. And now it's that we can record one podcast and tweet it and a hundred thousand people can listen to this. Software is an incredible version of this. So you can write one program, one set of rules, and it can execute 24 seven for years at a time for pennies. And there's, there's individual software programs now that are producing like hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And so the mindset behind leverage is how do you seek out and find these very asymmetric opportunities? Like where can you spend, you know, 10 or a hundred hours working on a project that is going to go work for thousands or tens of thousands of hours on your behalf? I've created this one book and now hundreds of thousands of people have read it at their own time and place and choosing. And that's truly wild. And when we see, you know, somebody earning tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and we're like, how is that even possible? Like that, that shock comes from a linear mindset where we don't understand that that person is just working with a huge amount of leverage and they're having massive impact because of the influence that they're able to have and the resource allocations decisions that they're making. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. As always, today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Before we get into today's conversation with Eric Jorgensen, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. If you enjoyed today's podcast, be sure to leave us a positive rating and review. Share this episode with a friend and subscribe to the show. Put up brand new interviews every single Monday and a brand new takeaways episode an audio exclusive where i sit down and break down the most recent podcast episode of the week every single thursday one other thing we need to cover before getting into today's podcast is exactly who is naval ravikant because eric has published the book the almanac of naval ravikant and so Naval is the founder and former CEO of AngelList, and he is a prolific tweeter with over 1 million followers in the very popular tweet thread, How to Get Rich Without Getting Lucky. And now, without further ado, I'm very excited to present to you my conversation with Eric Jorgensen. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. As always, I am your host, Jacob Kelly, and today's podcast is powered by TrueFan. Today on the show, we are joined by Eric Jorgensen. Eric is a creator of one of my favorite books from the last year, The Almanac of Naval Ravikant, and creator of the brand new online course and community, Building a Mountain of Levers. I'm very excited to have you on the podcast today. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. I got to bring you to parties. That's a slick intro. It saved me all kinds of awkward mumbling. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And I want to start today. I want to go all the way back to the beginning. So you grew up in Michigan, right? Yes, sir. God's high five. Grand Rapids? Uh, I actually grew up in Gross Point. Yeah, Gross just Point? outside Detroit. Yeah. Okay. And from my understanding, you grew up in kind of an entrepreneurial household, right? Like your dad had a business, your uncle owned a pizza shop, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. We were, we were multiple generations of entrepreneurs. and Everybody is like building or, or hustling something pretty much all the time. I was, I was busy like selling candy out of my locker as soon as I could, could figure out how to get that done. And uh, yeah, yeah, it's just part, part of the dinner table conversation for us. And so like how, like, obviously, like you mentioned, selling candy out of the locker and stuff, like how does that impact you growing up though, beyond just, just that? I, I feel really lucky to have known that like entrepreneurship is a path. Um, you know, like I, I think for a lot of people, it's very aspirational or feels gatekeepered or feels like far off. And it just kind of always felt normal to me. Like it was weird to go to college and be asked to like, choose a major. I'm like, no, 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 no. I'm just going to like start a business. How do I, how do I learn that? And they're like, well, you can like learn management or accounting. I'm like, no, no, I want to, I want to learn how to like start and run a business. No, like, that's not a thing. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I, I was just very lucky that it was normal. Mm -hmm. There's one other thing you did, I think 2009 or so you were, ordering, I think it was bamboo t-shirts off of Alibaba and trying to sell them. What's the story behind that? Cause that's like drop shipping before it became like mainstream. Yeah. I, I just had this like string of, of college kid companies, I guess, that are kind of like normal things for people to do in, in uh, I guess, normal for entrepreneurship. Um, I just, I just felt like constrained by classes and just like trying to focus on grades. I already knew I wanted, I didn't want to just like go get a job afterwards. I wanted to start building companies. Um, and so I started like a, a web design company and I was like importing bamboo t-shirts and helped start like a business, a student business incubator and started a blog and like nothing really was like particularly successful at all. Um, but it was a bunch of different random 
learnings about like how to do a piece here, a piece there. Um, and definitely got my ass kicked a few times, but, uh, that's all part of the process. And which one of those ideas was site fog? Oh, that was a, that came from a startup weekend. So that wasn't even my idea. Really. I, I went to, I won a Twitter contest actually to go to a startup weekend, uh, which is this like 54 hour hackathon thing where anybody can pitch an idea Friday night and then like teams form around ideas that get chosen. And then you just kind of work for a few days and Sunday night you get to pitch your idea, your company. And I didn't, uh, I didn't know totally what I was getting into there, but I just got lucky enough to win this contest. It showed up. And my move was just like pick the smartest programmer in the room and like join his team. And so he had this idea for sort of building this, uh, I think it was, it was like a JavaScript code snippet that would run on a website and it would use the processing power of the computer of the person who was on the website to sort of contribute to these giant distributed data set problems like uh, folding proteins or analyzing signals for extra- extraterrestrial intelligence or uh, I mean, today we would use it for like Bitcoin mining or something like that. So it was just spare CPU power. And I thought it was a really cool idea, but like he didn't want to pitch it. So I ended up pitching it. It's so always like this nice year old kid presenting like this genius programmer's idea as my own. Um, and I think so I think about it a lot. So I was like, I wonder if I had like gone down that path more aggressively, like put an early to a bunch of stuff that I was like, definitely not that early to. Um, but yeah, that, that was a really, that was a cool project. Um, it, but that was the first time I also got this idea of like, that thing had legs and I immediately was like, I am not ready to like CEO a real company and like raise money and have payroll on my back as like a 19 year old. Um, and so it was a really, it was a good kind of wake up call for me to be like, yo, you need to go like apprentice. Um, and so like, that was what I looked for in my next, you know, job or a couple, couple of years was like, how do I do like a CEO apprenticeship and learn how to do this thing the right way? Where does that self-awareness come from? Cause I feel like, especially for like a 19 year old kid, you think you can conquer the world, right? So where does that come from? I, I mean, I definitely did think I could conquer the world until I got like close to that cliff. And I was like, oh, um, that, that self-awareness just came from like, you know, where you like think you're an amazing driver and then like you get in a car with somebody who's like a really good driver um, or, or you like think you like going fast because you go 85 and then you get in a car going 120 and you're like, I'm not that comfortable at 120 um, on like a normal road. So it, it's just like kind of that context of like you push the envelope and push the envelope and then you find out what you're what you're capable of. And then you're like, Oh, I actually want to get there, but I know that it's going to take a few more, uh, intermediate steps. So let let, let me go find out what those are. I'm curious if like you knew the plan kind of from the get was entrepreneurship, why you were still planning to do three degrees in five years. Um, I think it's just like indecisiveness of like, I didn't know what would be helpful. And so I just wanted to like study a ton of stuff. Um, I was going to do uh, econ and finance and um, just this other Michigan State has this really cool uh, program that's like independent study uh, called the Bailey Scholars Program. It was like very independent study. And uh, I really love that. So that was going to be that was going to be the third kind of program focus. Um, but I was also I was really inspired by this, uh, not inspired enough to follow directly, but I met this guy um, at University of Michigan who was doing basically all four like main schools of thought. He was doing like math, philosophy, uh, science, like uh, computer science and political science. And I was like, that's an awesome, he's like the quad major. Um, and it, it, I just thought that was such a cool like way to approach trying to learn for somebody who's like not got a super clear career path. I was like, I don't know what's gonna be helpful, but I just wanna like learn all the big pillars uh, of thought. And so you were at Michigan State 2009-2010, right? Yeah. You also mentioned how, how you were building an incubator. Was that on campus? But I also found somewhere, I don't know if this was you or not, but were you a city project manager building and running the day-to-day operations at the Technology Innovation Center? Was that the incubator or was that something else? There was there was a lot going on. There still is a lot going on in East Lansing. Actually, it's a really kind of cool, um, small smallish city like government, but the government is really involved in supporting those businesses and stuff like that. So there was an established um, sort of like adult technology incubator called the TIC, the yeah, Technology Innovation Center. Um, and that was one of my first jobs was just like being the desk dude there and like showing people spaces and helping lease sign, them sign leases and get stuff done that needed to be done. I loved it because I was just like near technology companies and entrepreneurs. And um 
we were working on while I was there, we were, we like a big team of people like in the university and the government and some of the students were all contributing to this project called the hatch, um, which was like this collaboration between all of those things that want to see students start businesses and start to see them succeed and, um, see them hire and grow and whether they stay in East Lansing or not, like that is a great thing for, for kind of all involved. Um, and that's continued and thrived and grown and, uh, like there's still students starting businesses in there now, which I think is super, super cool. Was it at the technology innovation center where you organized the dirty feet adventure race? That was, that was my, like, so the guy who runs, ran the technology innovation center, that was like his brainchild and he organized that. And, um, I, I would just, it was like really lucky to help, uh, his name is Jeff Smith. He's an amazing guy. And like, has put together a ton of that. And he was like my first, one of my very first bosses who I like really looked up to and admired. It was like throwing events and just taking initiative to do all this kind of cool stuff. And the adventure race was one of those. So we got to like chart out this huge adventure race that was like kayaks and bike races and scavenger hunts. And it went like all over the city and took hours and hours. Um, so I, I mean, that was a small part of like trying to put that together. And it was a really cool thing to see. And um, I felt really lucky to be in Lansing like at that time because there was a bunch of people just kind of like opting into creating TEDx and Ignite and the uh, Lansing City Film Festival and like all of these events people were just creating out of thin air and there was a ton of energy and excitement and support um, and it was a really encouraging kind of thing and exciting atmosphere to be a part of. And like how do you take advantage of that atmosphere. You know what I mean? Like how were you going out, like meeting people all the time? Like how are you finding ways to get involved? I mean, I think like, it's interesting. Like that was the atmosphere. Like you put one toe kind of out there and like you end up in the right room and you kind of see all these people like trying to put this thing together, like put together an event, put together this. And they take so many people to get done that like, there's just always a way to contribute, whether it's just spreading the word or, um, showing support or helping sell tickets or talking about it or showing up, you know? Um, and it was a really, that kind of supportive community is, is I think a huge part of what led me to feel confident hosting a startup weekend there. So I eventually, like once I had gone to a startup weekend and had this kind of like transformative experience in Detroit and felt really lucky to go through that. Um, I was like, man, I think like all these other people are putting events together and they're really successful and they're all supporting each other. Like, I think I could bring this event here and have this be successful too. Um, and it was, and I, I hadn't really put those thoughts together until you like strung them all out. You know, this is, this is a long time ago now, but, um, yeah, I mean, I think, and, and that startup weekend was a huge kind of, uh, threshold for me, I guess, cause that led me to meeting all the other startup weekend organizers. And that led me to meeting Bo who like went on to start Zarly. And like, um, it was just a matter of like going to a ton of meetings and events and things until I met like the people and got in the right kind of flow that uh kept pulling me forward and so i mean one i love that it's like you can only you can never connect the dots looking forward you can only connect them looking back to steve jobs quote but you met you mentioned bo and so originally when you met him you were gonna it was an internship at a place called kaufman right yeah so i actually like i've met him for the first time right after sight fog right so like the, he was traveling to Detroit and we had this new kind of weird company. And whenever he traveled, he was just like, just show me, meet me, like introduce me to interesting companies that I can meet in this, in this new city. Um, and so we had like a half hour meeting with him. And so that's how I met him originally. It was just like a, I don't know, half investor, half connection kind of thing. And I was like, we just got along real well. I liked him a lot. And um, we had a great sort of start of that relationship and stayed in touch. And then startup weekend all got organized at Kaufman. Um, and so I was like, I, when I saw the Kaufman foundation, I was like, this is the coolest place I've ever been. This is entrepreneurs from all over the world. This is so Kaufman foundation is the biggest entrepreneurship foundation in the world. They have a endowment of some billions of dollars and they give away hundreds of millions of dollars to support entrepreneurship and the startup ecosystem around the world. So they funded things like general assembly and, uh, Sarah Lacey's first book and the early versions of like Angel List and there's there's all these things that like we all know and love that were that Kaufman has secretly kind of like helped along um, sort of quietly with with this endowment that they have and one of the projects there was Kaufman Labs that Bo was at the head of and it was like an incubator to rule all incubators it was like this the incubator for scale so for businesses you know like kind of a step after Y Combinator 
Um, and there were people there who were building like really incredible things. And I just thought it was a magical place. And I wanted to spend as much time as I could there. I was like, all right, this is the like one of the best in the world versions of what I'm already at, like doing in this small town. Like I want to come be a part of this. I want to be around these entrepreneurs. And um, yeah, that was, that was like how Bo originally hired me there, but that, that uh, did not last long. No, I think I have a quote here. Where was it? Something it was like you were in the room for maybe eight seconds, and he's like, "Hey, do you want to come build this other thing with me?" Something like that. Yeah, it was a very, it was kind of an awkward like onboarding at Kaufman because everyone was like, everybody clearly had like a secret that they didn't want to tell me, and I was like super excited and like ready to go, and everyone was just kind of like, "Yeah, maybe like hold your horses a little bit," Um, just because like they all knew that Bo was about to leave and I didn't. And so he like, I didn't even ever, I don't think fill out paperwork there. It was just like my first day of work at a nonprofit. Uh, my boss was like, I'm going to quit and go start this other company. Do you want to come or do you want to stay here? And I was like, this is a no brainer. Here we go. <laughs> like I'm, I'm here to work for you. Like wherever you work, I'm in. Why do you think he trusted you at that point to be one of the, like kind of the founding members of his company? Um, I mean, it was, I do not want to overstate this. Like I was not a co-founder of that company. Like yeah, I, was yeah. a, I was a barely paid intern. And so I think they like, uh, I mean, he trusted me enough to give me a shot, but it was like a very earned uh, thing on kind of a like continuous basis. I mean, it was very nebulous, right? Like this company just popped up as a startup, might not be around in nine months, right? Like that's the, that's the nature of the world. Mm-hmm. And so what is Zarly for people that are unfamiliar? So it is a market. It is now a marketplace for uh, home services. Um, so it, it's like been through a lot of things over the last like ten years or so. Originally, as it was founded in 2011, when I started working there, it was like a real time hyper local marketplace for anything. And so this is like before Instacart, before um, I don't, it might have been before. Uh, it was probably not before Uber, but it was right around the same time Uber started. Um, but we, we saw all of these use cases for like, you know, grocery shopping and airport rides and, and uh, like, I don't know, a ton. We were, we were like, trying to be Craigslist. We were like the meta marketplace. And so anything you could think of, you could type in this box. And it's like, I'll pay 50 bucks for a ride to the airport. I'll pay, pay 50 bucks for somebody to bring me a cheeseburger. It's like, oh, that became Postmates and that became Uber, you know, hundred bucks for groceries. Like that became Instacart. Um, and so we saw all these like verticalized use cases popping up. Like it was, it was a very, very interesting kind of place to work and crazy story as far as like how quickly it, it grew and how well funded and like the team blew up out of nowhere it was it was, it was a wild it was a very wild first job <laughs> i can imagine and part of the part of taking that first job required you dropping out of school and i have written i have a quote you're saying that you said it was a no-brainer i'm curious why you I mean like you're a few years into your school at that point you're probably three or four years into your five years why do you decide to forego education at that point and go all in on zarley i mean to me this is a, this is like both a personal decision and really unique to like the career path that I had in mind. Um, so like, I, I don't encourage like dropping out universally. Um, and, and I did end up getting a degree, right? So like it was to me, it was more of a no brainer to join Zarly and like not miss that boat than it was to drop out. Like we ended up kind of like finding the right compromise there and the university was great at like kind of working with me to close that loop. and. Um, but I just like, for me, the goal of college was to like, learn and meet people and like, get an exciting job at a cool place. And like, once that happened, I was like, okay, like, I'm ready, I'm ready to go on to the next thing. And like, I want to, I don't want to miss this opportunity to finish up this other thing that's happening. Right. Um, so yeah, that, I mean, it was, it was a super exciting thing and it was a very unique opportunity and got me out to San Francisco and like, I don't know, it just felt, uh, it was not a hard decision <laughs> then, then or now, I think. Um, but that's, it probably should feel like that, right? Like, I don't think it was a hard decision for like Zuckerberg to drop out of Harvard and go do Facebook, right? Like, Fair enough. And so jumping in, so that was 10 years ago now. You said 2011, right? Yeah. So 10 years now, we've flash forward 10 years. If you were starting school today, would you still look to go traditional education route or would you look to go straight to a startup and try and get a bunch of experience that way? I mean, it totally depends on what you want to do, right? Like, I think some of the most brilliant people I know are like incredibly well educated and like respected school and used it incredibly well. And um, it just depends on on who you are and what you want to do. I think, like, 
what I did kind of worked for me, but I also know that if I was like playing myself in the Sims, I would have made myself like do a harder major or like, uh, something that's just harder to like learn yourself. Um, I think I, I picked like a major that I was interested in, not a method of thought I wanted to instill in myself. Um, and I went to college not knowing exactly like what I was going to use it for. Um, so I like, I picked a big school because I wanted the community that came with like, you know, a big enough place when you subdivide it enough, you can find the people that are really into what you're into. And like, as I look back, that's really like the most valuable thing that I got there, but that's not going to be true for everybody. What do you mean by different method of thought? I mean, like, like this guy that studied like math deeply and philosophy deeply. And like, you can, you can see people's worldviews are like shaped by the ideas they, they study and let in their head. Like you can always tell when you're talking to an engineer, right? Like they think like an engineer in almost all aspects of life. Um, and some of those things are really hard to run on to like, program into yourself like it takes opting into a system right um so like you can be well this is this is like i, I can't even remember if i've written about this idea publicly but i th- I thought think about it like running a program on yourself right like um if you want to be a marine or a doctor or a lawyer like it's pretty hard to self-study your way into that like you don't just like sit down with some online courses in a book and like or like start doing push-ups in your backyard and like become a Marine or a doctor or a lawyer. So you have to choose to opt into this system that's going to like force you to do something incredibly hard that you wouldn't either wouldn't know how to do or wouldn't have the like willpower to do outside of this program, this system that's running on you. Um, and you have to choose to like opt into that and then just like give yourself over to it and let it, let it drive you. And I think that's, I didn't think of college like that, but if I had, I probably would have made like, I would have made it a little bit of a different decision of like, don't just let it, I would have figured out how to make, let it make me better instead of make me more of what I already am. Like, don't just transform yourself or transform yourself. Don't just like do what you already are. How would you describe your method of thought now? Method of thought. I don't know. So I think, I think of like, it's easy to label people by their major or something like that when they're like coming out of college or when they lend themselves towards a discipline. Um, and I kind of think of anybody who's not easily identifiable, you just kind of like lump into like generalists. Um, and, and all of us like weird generalists who have kind of like self-assembled all of these random things that we've read. Like, I'm sure we've read 20 of the same books, but 80 different books. And so like we could talk about like how the the books that we have in common have overlapped our thought and the experiences that we have in common have overlapped our thought. But we also have this other like huge chunk of influence on us that is like pulling those ideas around and like adding to them. Um, and I think it's really interesting to see how unique we all are. And so you can find those like atomic points that overlap, but you know, you're, you're you are never going to totally understand or be able to replicate all of the like weird methods of thought that I have from like the strange combinations of like sci-fi and fantasy that I've read and like rationalist fan fiction and like, you know, boring Netflix series. And like, it just, it's a, such a weird um, thing that we slowly layer on these unique experiences until we have this totally unique perspective and framework and like maps that go outward in our brain as soon as we think of like a new idea all the associations and the second and third degree associations are just like even weirder um and it, i don't know it's fascinating to think about you can't spend like too much energy on it because as soon as you start thinking about like every single other individual is as deep and nuanced and unique as like all of your weird thoughts are it just gets like deeply overwhelming and hard to do anything um but it's a lot of fun I don't know. You got me, you got me in a weird headspace now. I'm just like trying to think <laughs> about my own methods of thought. It's crazy. I'm curious if what you consume influences your interest or if your influences influence what you consume, because I've often reflected on my own time. And like when I had my photography phase, I was consuming a ton of photography, videography content. And, and, and so, but now I'm, I'm heavily into screenwriting right now. So I'm consuming a ton of screenwriting content, 
but I'd try to like look back and I'm like, did I start consuming that photography content before I got into it? Or did I start consuming it because I was getting into it? So I'm curious kind of what, how you look at that for yourself. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it's definitely both, right? Like you, you probably had like this thin approach of photography and then you like, it slowly like took over more and more and then like kind of came back from there. Um, I think that's how I see it. Right. Like I'm, I'm starting to consume stuff about like, I'm not actively really writing any fiction, but I'm like starting to think about it and like read more about it. And like, maybe that means in five years I'm writing, but maybe it means I'm not reading about it at all in a few months. And like that passes and I'm thinking about like city planning or architecture or whatever. Um, but all of these things are like far flung. I do, I do try to get better at like practicing stuff as I'm learning about it instead of just like saying that I want to learn about it and learning it. Right. Um, which photography and screenwriting are like great examples of that. That must be nice to be able to just like go do it immediately as you're learning about it. Yeah, it's been great. I've been trying to write three in a row, like just three rough drafts in a row. And I started in the middle of February and I'm um, about probably two thirds of the way through the third one now. So I'm almost done the three rough drafts, which is awesome. But um, one interest that you have that I was curious about specifically was comedy. Cause like right before getting into the screenwriting thing, I got had like a brief comedy phase where I was learning about comedy. Um, and so I'm curious where your interest for comedy developed. That I've been listening to stand up like forever. Like I remember like that was just a thing on road trips for us. And like, we would listen to the like comedy channel on the radio. And uh, I don't know. It just seems, it seems like a timeless format. And I just have so many like, weird early things that I learned, um, listening to like comedy greats. Uh, this was like a thing in our house, like Robin Williams. And, um, I, I mean, they, like we went way back, uh, the serious XM thing, like takes you, takes you all the way. Um, and you just get this like, weird amalgamation of all these different styles and like little different clips and stuff like that. Um, and I think it's a weird, it's, it is a, is comedy is very educational. Like comedy doesn't get enough credit for how much educating it does, I think. Um, and how honest it gets to be. And I, I look at it differently than I did. Um, but I think as a, as a kid, I was attracted to, so I was like, cause it's fun. And like all these people are just like saying whatever they actually believe things that other people are afraid to say. Um, and yeah, it's, it is a kind of always been, somewhere a part of my life um and a good reminder to just like you never taking anything too seriously um but comedy is always like right out at the edge like in the same way that entrepreneurship is kind of like pushing the boundary of maybe what's available or convenient or easy or like what's the human experience like you know this whole art frontier and comedy frontier is always pushing the lines of like what are we talking about? How are we thinking about it? What are we comfortable with? Who's comfortable with it and who's not? Um, and I think that's like a, a super, super interesting place to be and place to study. And uh, yeah. Have you read the book, I'm Dying Up Here? No. I'm Dying Up Here is written by this guy named, I'm going to butcher his last name, but it's like William Doldstead or something like that. Um, he, was, he used to cover comedy in LA back in the day. And he put together like a book that just breaks down the history of the golden age of comedy in the 1970s around the, with the comedy store. Um, so it's when a bunch of unknown comics like Jay Leno, Freddie Prince, uh, Robin Williams, David Letterman, they all kind of descended on LA at the same time. And it's like the story of that. Super interesting. If you're into comedy, I highly recommend it. Um, yeah. Are you, are you like getting, are you going to go like do some sets or what? I haven't gotten, haven't committed yeah. that far yet. Um, yeah. this was back a couple of months ago and then I interviewed, I interviewed Tom Dreesen. He, he was one of the people that was in that book and I just happened to find his website and there was like a, it was like a broken site, but I filled out the contact for me ended up coming on the show and he was telling nice. me I should give it a shot. So nice. we'll see. I'm still up in Canada and nothing's opened right now up here. Like we're still in okay. the lockdown. So, um, I have some time to think about it. I think uh, I think comedy comedy is also underrated in that it plays a role in almost everything else, right? Like stand up is a universal form, but it's also like very few people can do stand up, and it's scary as shit, and it takes a lifetime of craft to learn it. But you learn so much listening to it about like timing and setup, and I, I think like I think it has helped me learn to just like be 
it has helped me in conversation. It's helped me in like my writing for my nonfiction writing. It's helped me in fiction, right? Like just, I think it gives you a lot of, um, a lot of other kind of hidden sort of like superpowers, um, just by enjoying consuming it and like picking up some of those patterns and things. Like, even if you're never going to do stand up, like spending time with that is fun. Even for screenwriting, I'm sure. Right. Like, exactly. Have you yeah. done any sets or anything? No, I, I'm like, I really like the idea of it, but I also know that it's useless to dabble in that. I think like you got to really commit to the craft for like a long period of time or, or you're going to be like really bad. And I don't think that's, um, I think there's, that is maybe more true in stand up than it is in a lot of other things. Um, and so I'm like, that's a thing that's like, if I could dabble, I would love to dabble, but I feel like I'd be doing everyone like myself <laughs> and the audience a disservice. If I, if I dabbled instead of committed. Yeah, that's fair. And there's, I'm curious, like I, cause you kind of mentioned how stand up skills are transferable from stand up to many different areas of life. Are there any other random skills that you developed or anything that transferred over, whether it be into business sense or other aspects of your life? Like I know you used to row crew, like just things you learn when you used to row crew, does that benefit you in a business sense or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, I'm sure to, like almost everything does. And it's, you know, in the same way, it's hard to connect the dots looking back. It's hard to figure out like where you learned different things and like, where they come from and each experience kind of forms your worldview and, and your expectations about different things. Um, I think crew crew gave me definitely a, uh, an appreciation for just like commitment and discipline and how long these things take. Like you just have to put in a ton, a ton, a ton of reps on stuff and be patient and it'll come through. Um, that, that, that gave me like a strong mental gain, like pretty, pretty early in life um, that I'm, that I'm very grateful for. Okay. And when did you start to try and build a personal brand? When did that come? Oh, never. I hate that. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. So like, Cal, re reframe it. When did you start growing your Twitter? Or did you do it consciously, like with intent? Um, so I joined Twitter in like 2010. Basically, I mean, during the era that we were talking about when like, it was basically a local organizing tool. Like you joined Twitter to like, meet other people around you who were doing like interesting things and to, like find out when events were um or to like follow people who were going to be at the next event like it was a very like i like i joined it to meet the other people in lansing and to um and then from there like it ended up being like kind of helpful in the startup world and i started like learning it was a learning tool for me like just to consume and follow people and find blog posts and for a long time, I, I didn't share much or shared very sporadically and just consumed and saved stuff to pocket. And then when I started blogging more, it was, it was a resource. Like I would go, I would, you know, say, Hey, I'm writing a post about network effects. Like what's the best thing you've ever watched, seen, listened to whatever about network effects and, um, grown from there. And so it's always been more of a, like a resource and a I don't know. I, I like to think of it like a giant living room, right? Like I'm, I'm not building a personal brand. I'm not trying to build a business. I'm just like being myself at scale and hopefully meeting other people who are themselves at scale. Um, and getting to kind of peek inside their head and get exposure to ideas and people and things that I never would otherwise. Um, and I think that that gives me a lot of I get a lot of perspective from that, right? Like it's helpful to go see people who are super different from you and be like, oh, that's a lot to learn, a lot to appreciate, a lot to think about. Um, and it gives you this kind of sense of, it shifts you from like first person to third person, you know, when you can scroll through like thousands of people from all over the world's thoughts, you're like, whoa, like it's, it's an out-of-body experience on like a species scale. Like it's it's just crazy. And so how do you approach the way you consume content? Are you just trying to follow the best accounts so it's all in your feed? Do you use a lot of lists? Like what's that look like for you? Yeah, I, I like the um, the recency timeline actually because I don't like the algorithm interfering with stuff. Uh, and I try to, like if I follow an account, like I want to see like almost everything from that account. Um, and I worry sometimes that like the really high signal kind of lower volume accounts get drowned out by the algorithm, the people who are tweeting like five times a day. Um, so I use the the recency thing, which you can change and 
like it's like old school Twitter. Maybe it's just because I like started using Twitter back when that was all I was. Um, that that's what I prefer, and I try and fail to keep my following list short so that I can actually see like a lot of what everybody's sharing. Um, but there's so much exciting stuff out there, and it's hard to like keep. It's hard to pass on, you know, what could be something super exciting and fun. Yeah. And how have you grown it? 36.1 thousand right now, I think is where you're, where you're sitting. Like, how have you gotten to that point? Slowly. I mean, like I've been on Twitter for, you know, more than 10 years now. Um, and so it's been very, you know, there hasn't been a huge thing. Like I grow faster when I'm posting a lot or when I'm working on like a big project. Um, but you also grow faster, the bigger your following gets. And so I grew slow for, or not at all for five or seven years in there. Um, but like now that I have a book out and do podcasts and have a bunch of followers already, like stuff just tends to spread further. And so that grows a little faster, but, um, you know, I, I know there are people and I know people who've gone, you know, zero to hundred thousand followers and approach it very scientifically and like, get real aggressive with it. And like, that's just not, that is not my approach. Um, you know, I'd rather, I, I, I'm, I may already be past the golden age of Twitter where I had like 5,000 followers and like a hundred good friends. And like, we just knew more about each other. And it was more of like, a it was less broadcasty and more two way. Um, and I try to kind of keep it. I try to keep it there. I try to follow people that like I'm interested in, having a conversation with and replying to and, you know, um, yeah, I, I keep it, keep it high signal for myself. Cause if you, if you can't trust like your, you know, I spend a lot of time on Twitter and like those inputs become my thoughts and become my worldview. And like, I really have like, if I follow you, that, that's a compliment. Like I'm, I want your thoughts in my head and I trust you to only put good stuff there. Um, and I don't trust myself to like be able to filter all that out afterwards. Like we tend to just believe whatever's in our head without thinking about it too hard. So, um, yeah, I try to be really careful about, about what's there and, um, what I consume. Yeah. That's a good way to think about it. Cause I feel like I just often find I'm scrolling and I'm just, there's people on my Twitter. I need to clean it. Essentially this conversation make me realize you need to go through and to clean who I'm following on Twitter. Cause there's a lot, a lot of inputs coming in to your point. <laughs> um, but you mentioned how early on with Twitter, you used to tweet like, Hey, I'm trying to learn about network effects. Link me all your favorite or your favorite articles. Is that that explain it the best? That was for your blog, right? It was called evergreen, I believe. Yeah. And so the thought process, correct me if this is wrong, but so what evergreen was, was you tweet something out like that, like, Hey, I want to learn about this. And you get all the replies and then you'd consume it all within a week and then summarize it in a weekly email and blog post. Right. Yeah, that was that was probably circa 2015 or so. Um, yeah, it started with like a small mailing list, you know, ten friends or whatever, and um, and my little Twitter, and it was just like I picked one topic every week. It was kind of my self administered MBA, um, and I ended up like learning a ton doing it. But it just came from this ethos of like everything was like everything you Google has been like very engineered to show up on the first page of Google. Um, and every, you know, when you look at like Hacker News or Twitter or anything, it's all very temporal. It's like whatever the most recent thing was. Um, but there's all this content that's like truly evergreen and amazing and life changing if it finds you at the right place. And so I really wanted to build, still do want to build um, the, the like the library of the internet, you know, like Google's your command F key, uh, Reddit's your front page, Wikipedia's your encyclopedia. But like the library is the place you go where everything is incredibly well organized and thorough and vetted and it's all above a certain quality bar. It's more than you would ever need, but it's only the quality stuff. You know, you don't have you don't have junk shit in the library because someone's curating it and someone can help you find exactly what you need when you get there. And I think that's a piece that's still missing in our in our internet. And that's an ethos that like we can build towards. Um, but that's what I was like bootstrapping with that blog is like you know just holding that flag up and getting an audience that like got that and had fun with it and you know built up a decent decent sized following like burned myself out horribly on that schedule because that was incredibly exhausting um but i had a ton of fun doing it it's rewarding to like put something out every week and you know see people appreciate it and that thing still gets a ton of traffic and um it, it's also nice to see that evergreen is truly evergreen and, and people are still getting value out of it <laughs> How are you figuring out what to to learn about each week? I um, mean, it was just stuff that I was confused about that I needed to know for work. <laughs> um, like, okay. uh, 
I, there's there's so much like I, I tried to keep it a little focused. I, I it, the tagline was kind of like you know building business brains, and so it was like um, you know we did network effects, we did um, hiring, we did competitive advantages. It was kind of a mix of like very tactical you know management and growth things, and a little bit of kind of strategic like what are all the different competitive advantages? Like how do you do you know low cost versus network effects versus like, you know, whatever else is going on. And there's so much, there's so much to learn. And each of those topics is like so fractal um, that there was, there's plenty to do. And there's a ton of good material out there. It was very rewarding to find like some amazing posts that one person sent me from Germany. That's like, you know, that when you show it to people, they're like, Oh, nobody's ever told me this in this way before. Like, this is incredibly valuable. Thank you for, thank you for digging this up. That's, and so ultimately, so you burnt out with it. Was it just trying to keep up with putting out a new blog post, new email every single week while having to consume everything at the same time? Yeah. And I mean, I had a full-time job at the time too. It was just like, sometimes I would like finish work for the week and like sit down Friday at six and start. And so it was like, I went from a sprint of a week to a sprint during the weekend. And that was, that was hard. Um, so eventually I slowed the schedule down a little bit. And I mean, I, I took this leap of trying to get towards building the actual like, software platform um and that like just ran out of money and time and attention to like make the leap from blog to that but i stopped writing in order to get that and in order to work on the platform um and then just like that i was like i don't know if this is actually going to get there and um went through a couple different engineers i was like this is not going to get there um so then i started uh i just kind of shelved that project and started working on working on other things but uh i maybe naively have the hope that i'll get to come back to it uh or or that somebody else will pick up that ball and run with it and uh i won't have to start another company to (laughs) go after that with that notion of are you saying how you'd sprint monday to friday then have to sprint friday night through sunday in high school i believe was you met an olympian rower who said his favorite time to to work out and train is on Christmas day, just because that's when no one's working. So essentially like working every single day, is that the mindset you still have today? Are you, have you instituted more rest days and recovery days just in your total work life balance schedule? I've gotten much better. I've gotten more balance and I've got like more balance and more competing demands. Right. So you're like juggling more balls and your context switching more, which like, makes it easier to burn out and harder to align all those things. Um, so you have to kind of like, I'm finding build more padding into my schedule in order to focus on more unpredictable things coming up. Um, so I think part of that is part of that attitude was like youth and uncertainty and just like being super high energy and not like not knowing how to learn what to work on. Um, and so just like substituting that with a ton of hard work, um, my current process, uh, you know, I still, I think I still work plenty hard, but like it is, I work harder at figuring out where to put the hard work. Um, and just, you know, this is where the idea of leverage comes in, right? Like what's the, what are the one or two things that are the highest and best use of, of my time and energy and attention that are going to, you know, provide the greatest returns in happiness or profits or my family or whatever, um, to, to keep all that going smoothly. And how do you figure that out? I think it helps to have a, I have a little bit of a process and I have some frameworks and I'm still kind of, um, it's, it's hard to connect the dots looking forward, as we've said, um, but it helps to have a lot of reps in historically and taking a longer term view, looking back at, you know, with, with humility at some of the things that I've like worked incredibly hard on that haven't proven to be valuable. Um, and then figuring like, you know, it's a little bit of expected value math. It's a little bit of expected effort. It's a little bit of seeing your way through, like, you know, not just step one, but steps two and three and four. And like, if I go down this path, where am I going to be then? And then, and then and trying to see a few chess moves ahead. Um, so you can like anticipate roadblocks and not have to double back. Um, yeah, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. I think I, like it's annoying to say that it comes with age, but I think it comes it comes with experience. It comes with perspective. Um, at least it has for me. I know there there are plenty of people who are far wiser at young, younger years than I was, but um, yeah, it, it it takes it takes running into some walls for for me for me to have figured out that there's walls there and I should anticipate them instead of run into them. 
Fair enough. And how do you, you can you mention how it's figuring out not just steps one, but steps two, three, four, five, six, when do running through that, that mental exercise of figuring out what those steps are, how do you keep yourself from getting overwhelmed? Cause I remember when I was starting my business, like I'm talking, like I just registered it. I signed my first client. I had one day, like a month in where I was overwhelmed that I don't know how to hire people and what that looks like. But I was like, I'm overwhelming myself with step nine and I'm on like step 0.5 right now. Like, how do you keep yourself from getting overwhelmed when examining everything that's to come? Yeah, I think you, like I try to remind myself, you don't need, you don't need to do step nine. You know, you just need to, you just need to understand that it's there. Like the farther out the steps get like one, the less, the less certainty you need and the less precision you need. You know, you don't have to do like, you know, you don't have to estimate out pro formas for three years down to the decimal point. Decimal point, you can just be like, well, the napkin math works, um, you know, for, for year three. So I'll do like slightly more precise math for year one. So like, let's, you know, allocate the budget to month one. Um, and, you know, if you're finding yourself having to be like super, super precise and detailed all the way through, like you're probably wasting energy. Um, but if you know enough to, if you know enough to know that like I could hire one on, someone on step nine, I don't need to know how to do that yet. I don't even really need to know where to start. I just know that like, you know, maybe there's the economics still work when someone gets hired and like that's step nine. So like, there's not a dead end here. So like I can roll, like, let's go. I think it's, it's maybe more a process of like understanding the dead ends than it is knowing how to navigate the whole map. Right. I like that. That's a good way to look at is knowing where the dead ends are. And so kind of jumping a little bit here, we talked about Twitter, learning in public is obviously what you did with Evergreen and Twitter and everything. And speaking of, this wasn't necessarily, this was kind of learning in public, but ultimately the book, the Naval Manac, or was originally called the book of knowledge, started <laughs> with just a tweet, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the title, uh, the original title went away almost immediately. I think the first reply to the tweet was like, yes, but please do it with a better title. And I was like, all right. <laughs> good feedback um yeah the, the, the of almanac is like my nickname for it um the official title title being the almanac of naval ravikant but to be fair that's a mouthful so uh yeah we had to i, I can't exist a, a portmanteau if it's in front of me i'm gonna i'm gonna smash those words together fair enough and so you make the tweet saying hey should i basically comb the internet for all of Naval's knowledge and compile it into one resource. And Naval himself ended up retweeting it, if I'm not mistaken, right? And then, like, you went to bed, woke up with like 5,000 replies of people telling you to do this. Yeah. I just, I mean, it was a very small seed of an idea that all of a sudden I was very committed to and had grown in scope considerably. I was like, I'm just going to do a little one, like, no problem. And then, as soon as Naval was like, I'm in, I'm happy to give you all this stuff, like, rock on. Um, and with that kind of size of validation like my my bar instantly went up for it my like i was like and then i thought it was going to take like you know three months and then i got everything in front of me and it's like a million words of source material and almost a hundred sources and i'm like oh my god this is going to be this is going to be a minute um so it ended up taking a few years and i'm i'm glad i took my time with it because i feel like i could have done it in a year and a half and it would have been 10 percent as good um and and the whole point was to make something you know more more timeless and like capture all of the valuable things that Naval has said in this like evergreen sort of universal like permanent format that's gonna it's gonna be useful for people for decades. Why, for lack of a better word, why did Naval trust a random person on the internet to put this book together? I have truly no idea. Um, I, I have no. I don't think he followed me or knew of me before that. I don't think he did. I have no idea if he did any diligence or anything like, or even clicked on my Twitter profile or was just like, yeah, go ahead, like do it. Um, maybe he did, maybe like, and it's possible that like, you know, those years of blogging, like were proof of work that like I knew how to do things at a decently high level is, is possible. Um, that if I was, a you know, an egg with five followers, like it, he wouldn't have said yes, but I, I don't know. Um, we've never, we've never, I've never asked, uh, but no, I think it's, he, he's also very generous with, I mean, most people who ask him, like, can I translate this? Can I share this? Can I like, he has said yes to almost everybody that I've seen, um, ask him for things publicly that are, that are no additional lift for him. Um, so yeah, I think he's just very generous with his work and wants to see it, you know, 
improved and up-leveled and distributed in all the ways that it can be. And you mentioned how once you got it all in front of you, it was like a million words of material. What was your approach to tackling those a million words? Was it like, I'm going to go podcast first, tweet second, or how did you even just approach climbing that mountain? I I started with tweets um, on the logic that it would be a microcosm of everything else. So as I, as I sorted and filtered and categorized all the tweets, um, that gave me a structure and an outline and a framework to put everything else, fit everything else in. Um, and the tweets are a little easier to work with in that like they're small enough. And once they're categorized, you can kind of like pull them in and out of things and then fit passages and prose around those tweets as like the tentpole ideas. And like, where were you organizing everything? Was it like a Notion, Evernote, Google, and maybe a combination? I do. It was Google Docs, man. I did everything in Google Docs. Um, and I'm sure all the like productivity tool nerds are going to cringe hearing me say that and tell me there's better tools for it. But like I did Google Sheets and I did Google Docs and it it pretty much worked. Those are the tools I was familiar with and they they, they worked out well. And how are you deciding like how to categorize everything? I'm just, you just got to kind of like make it up. Uh, like it, it's a weird thing to it, like, that's part of the creative process, I guess, is like figuring out, like, like I had some of the same moments that like, where you ask that question and you're like, well, where am I supposed to figure that out? And then you're like, oh, that's my job. That's part of my job in this project is to like figure out how to categorize and like, that's a thing I just get to make up. So like, let me just start making them up. And then you do that once and then you're like, revisit and you're like oh that was actually i did kind of a bad job making those up i'm gonna make them up again um and like restart it and it's uh it's hard to figure out what kind of work you're doing sometimes and like that's that's i think part of the process and for the for the podcast were you transcribing everything yourself or were you using otter or something like that i use otter otter is a lifesaver for transcription there's still a lot to fix on those um but that was that was clutch and so what was the, like the, cause you, you didn't contribute like original thoughts to this, right? Like you just organized everything. Um, and so what was like, how much of it was just consuming? How much was it structuring? How much was it like actually putting the book together? Like how did it break down over that three year window? Um, is a lot of, it, it feels the best metaphor I have is like doing a jigsaw puzzle, right? So like half the time you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, you're like looking for a piece. And then half the time you're like trying to find the right place for the piece to fit. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of consuming and reconsuming. So I, I, I did a lot of reading and a lot of listening and to all his interviews and transcripts and posts and tweets. Um, but there's also a lot of time where you're just kind of like looking at the pieces and trying to figure out how they fit together and like moving them around. Um, and it's those, it's hard to separate those a little bit sometimes. Um, but yeah. And then, and then there's the, all of the like infrastructure stuff, right? And so like setting up the Twitter account and the website and the email list and, you know, talking to people and finding editors and um, you know, there, there's, there's a whole like support team of people who do it. I think it's, it's always worth saying like there's one name on the front of the book, but like there's 50 in the back and like Kathleen Martin was this amazing editor um, who really like helped professionalize all the pros and made that easy. Scribe did all of the design and publishing and page layout and font selection. And uh, Jack Butcher obviously did all the illustrations, which I think lend a ton to the, kind of the depth of some of these ideas and the book and the the whole like vibe that we put together. Um, and he was another, I mean, the whole thing really just like came together on Twitter, um, just like talking about what I was doing. It was kind of magical. Mm-hmm. was naval doing a in a brand new interview did that like break your world for like a 48 hour window when you had to figure out if it's still consistent with everything you've got and how you fold that new material in yeah there's definitely some like treadmill running where like you know a new like joe rogan interview came out and i was like oh god all right all right you gotta go find like gonna go transcribe this thing and figure out like did he say a new idea did he say a bet an old idea in a better way did he like you know, and he was constantly like tweeting and doing interviews throughout this process. And so, you know, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle. People are throwing new, new puzzle pieces at your face. You're like, Oh yeah. Some of them are really helpful. And sometimes it's a distraction and you just never know. I've interviewed um, a number of people who have worked on Gary V's team and 
just hearing them talk and like the way they think it's like there's a little Gary sitting on their shoulder just because they've been in that world for so long. Did that happen to you now? Is there like a little Naval that follows you around every day that you can kind of like talk to and help you work through decisions just because you were in kind of in his mind for lack of a better word for so long? Yeah. Um, and thank God that I don't have a Gary V on my shoulder because I love Gary V, but damn, like I feel like just right next to your ear all day. That'd be, that'd be a lot. Um, I'm very, I'm very happy to have a Naval on my shoulder. Uh, yeah, that it's, it takes a lot of work to like get somebody in your head so thoroughly that you can like have a conversation with them. Um, you know, like kind of like building a personal board of directors in your head. Um, and like, this is why I've got this little, like, there's a little Ben Franklin on my desk and like a little Charlie Munger. Um, so I can like read enough of their stuff and have enough of their ideas in there that you can sort of test what you're thinking about or what you're about to do or your idea with like your experience of them and their thoughts. Um, and sometimes it's a, it's a little bit, you know, like Dwight Schrute. Like I asked myself if an idiot would do that and then I do not do that thing. <laughs> I love that. The original manuscript was 600 pages, I believe. Yeah, it was, it was long. It was like, uh, I kind of took like the poor Charlie's almanac approach and I just like categorized absolutely everything that I could find that I thought was worth saving. Um, and it was huge, uh, it, like way too big. Um, and I, when I got peer readers who were like, yeah, I read like half of it and like, then I just kind of got tired or I skipped this whole chapter. I was like, that's not the kind of book I want to put out. Um, and I felt better once I could put all of that stuff on, on the website and still share it all. Um, so people who were excited about, you know, going down the like education rabbit hole or the futurism or like seeing all the balls predictions could still do that. But like, I didn't have to publish it in the book um, and, and muddy that up for everybody who just wanted some of the clean, like kind of mainstream, super evergreen ideas. And so it got cut down to two sections, wealth and happiness. And I know that one of the reasons for that is you, you're out of your proofreaders. I believe there's about 30 of them, 30 beta readers. They all read those two sections. Like those were the ones that always got read. Why? And I mean, like, I know you joke that if people want to be rich and happy, of course, but like, what is it about those two that kept bringing people in? Uh, they're both. So the, on the happiness section, like they're very timeless ideas, right? Like Naval, I don't think is coming up with a ton of new ideas about how to be happy, but he is rephrasing like ancient sort of Buddhist wisdom for us from all of the things that he's reading. Right. Um, and in the same way, like, these are universal desires and universal challenges that like almost all people have. Um, so the happiness section, you know, it should be no surprise if he's phrasing well, these ancient ideas, um, the wealth side, I think it's more, is more novel. Um, and he did a really like sort of interesting service in synthesizing all of these things about like half of them are maybe commonly understood ideas and half of them are kind of surprisingly new based on his experience in the technology industry. It's like, like the world is changing and some of these things are timeless truths like accountability, right? Like if you want to, you want society to reward you with wealth, you have to take accountability for the work that you're doing. Um, if you want to earn outsized returns, you need to have, be able to do something that no one else can do. Like these are basic ideas that he phrases incredibly simply and clearly with great examples. Um, but some ideas like leverage are very new and very, unique. And if you're not familiar with, even if you are familiar with technology, you might not have heard that sort of mental model broken out before. But if you're not, it's one of those ideas that like, you, you're really sailing upwind if you're trying to make it big in the modern world without understanding leverage. And you're not able to see why some people are having the results that they're having. And, and you may not be. One of your goals was for it to be one of the most highlighted books in the Kindle store. Is that a trackable metric? It, I think so. So Readwise has a like, uh, they put out, I think every year, like the most highlight dense books. Um, and so I'm eagerly awaiting the next update from them because they, they have like, this is awesome tool. They, you can upload all your Kindle highlights and they'll email you like a few every day. Um, you can like set them as popular and help you remember all these things. Um, and so they, 
I would talk to those guys when I was writing the book and they were like telling me about, you know, some of the other books with high highlight density. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting on the, I'm waiting on the report. I hope we do it. I hear, I see people send me photos with like just dog eared and all marked up margins. It's like, okay, that's good. That means we hit a, we hit a threshold. A hundred percent. I like, la- I, I read it last year and took so many notes when I was going through it. And one thing too, so I, when I first read the book, I read the free PDF version because you put the whole book out for free, planning to buy physical copies for myself and like gifts and stuff to hand out or to give out to people. But why was it, why where was the decision? Where did that come from to make the book free? Because there's so much value packed inside of it that people would happily pay for and they are paying for it, but there's still a free option. I'm curious why. Yeah. So that was a, one of the things that Naval requested. Um, it was like, if you're going to do this, like, make it free, make it freely available. Um, and I'll give you all the access in the world for it. Um, which is great. And, and I, I thought I understood why he wanted to do it, but I also see increasingly like more reasons for it as you get, you know, questions from people who like don't have Amazon or Kindle or whatever in their country. And so want access to the book and it's like, it's all online. It's all free. Here you go. Um, it's no problem. So uh, these ideas, I truly, I truly think like, at least one idea in the book can help almost any person on the planet. Like they're just so universal. Um, and I'm really glad that we're able to, that that was part of the project and part of the ethos from the very beginning. And that I think that is, um, you know, it's impossible to know, but I think that's helped it spread, you know, way farther than any, maybe like a normal analog only book could. Mm. I have a quote here kind of about shipping the book itself and the quote is one of the side effects of committing to a three-year book project is that i have to watch a lot of half-assed ideas come and go that i might have taken a shot at previously being committed to this for a long time has let me naturally filter out my next what my next project should be is that a good thing or a bad thing uh it's both um it's definitely both and i definitely would have like gone down the crypto rabbit hole probably a little sooner if i had been able to like have had like less uh, if I'd had more free time, um, but I also would have like wasted some time on some very dumb ideas, I'm sure. But like that kind of comes with the territory. Um, yeah, it's it's a tough it's a tough thing to know, right? It's kind of like I don't know if you've read Essentialism by Greg McCown or not, uh, where it's essentially like pick those one or two things that are essential to you. It's making one decision in, in advance so you can make a bunch of decisions down the road that are already made for you. Does it contribute to my essential thing? then it's a yes. Does it not? Then it's a no. Do you try and kind of have that, not the essentialism philosophy, but the philosophy you have when putting the book together, where you were just so focused on one task that you weren't doing other things. Do you try and have that same approach now? Or are you juggling a few more things than you were at the time when you're putting the book together? I like to think of it like, um, uh, Naval breaks this down into like explore and exploit. And I think it's, I think it's some of both, right? So you go this through this thing where you're trying to like do trying out a bunch of stuff at once, tr- experimenting with a few different things, reading broadly. And then you're kind of like, Oh no, this is like one really good thing. I'm like going all in on this for a minute and like kind of, you know, put your blinders on and like execute it. Uh, and then come out and like explore and reorient again. And I think that's like a natural good cycle. And, you know, the more you can do of both and the faster you can go back and forth between the two, like, you know, you'll, you'll see some interesting results. Mm. I like that. I think that I think kind of hearing that makes me realize I think that's what I've done with this screenwriting thing. Like I was just trying a bunch of different stuff and then I kind of latched onto it and I've been kind of head down on that. That's been like my evening weekend project lately. Another quote, I'm a big fan of quotes and I have another one of your quotes here about putting this book together. And it's, you don't decide to write a book once you decide a hundred times because you constantly have to convince yourself to keep going. What was the closest you got to quitting over the three year period of doing this book? The, the blessing that comes with like, instant like market validation and Naval is that like I, I never was contemplating quitting. I was, I was only like the fear was that it would suck. Not that I wouldn't finish it. <laughs> like uh, I got afraid that I would never be able to make it as good as I wanted it to um, or that it was taking too long, but I never even like thought that I would, I, I knew I would never let myself not finish it or not put something out. And how did it feel to finally have a physical book in your hands? That was a, that was a pretty crazy. It was very cool. Like that had snuck up on me. Like you see the cover, you see the, this, you see the, this, but then like when you're holding, you like unfold this giant box of your books. Uh, I don't know. It was, it was, 
that was a special special day would it have had the same impact as it's had had you upload the whole thing as like a website with a bunch of blog posts no i'm pretty sure not i think there's this like there's still this weird arbitrage where like you can write a book's worth of stuff and publish it online and it doesn't have the same impact as knowing that like it is a book that is like published with an isbn that is for sale um it's just one of those like not logical Rory Sutherland things that is just like an undeniable thing. Um, but I think it's also harder to write a whole book and put it all together than it is to just write, you know, 50,000 words on the internet in a disjointed sort of way. Um, so I think there's like, there's definitely a, a gap there. Um, and it, there deserves to be a gap. It's probably bigger than like logic would expect it to be. Uh, but it's, it is a, Publishing books are a hard thing. Um, so I got I got mad respect for anybody who finishes and publishes a book. One thing you've, like you mentioned it earlier, was Poor Charlie's Almanac. And I know that was an important book for you kind of growing up. I know you read that early on. How does it feel to have released a book kind of along the same vein that could have a similar impact that Poor Charlie's Almanac did? How did it feel to, like to put out your own version of that book? Uh, really super amazing um and also like terrifying like i was so I, I thought almanac was the perfect word but i was so afraid to use it because i think so i have so much respect for the lineage of almanacs that has come before like poor richards and poor Char charlie's are just so were so formative for me and for so many people and um i don't know i didn't want to use that i didn't want to lean lightly on that um it, like i really wanted to do justice to that idea and make something that was as impactful and high quality. Um, and I, when I hear people say like, oh, I get, you know, yeah, this is my like 18 year old brother. And it like totally blew his mind and changed how we looked at the whole world. Um, yeah, that's, I would have loved to have had that book at 18 and to be able to kind of like do this for other people is, um, is awesome. It's really, really great. What are some similarities and differences of Naval and Charlie? Um, I mean, their, their, uh, difference of opinion on cryptocurrency is, uh, pretty well understood at this point. Um, I, I really, I was lucky to find Munger early because I think he's a really good filter for like when I find other people who appreciate Munger and who have read him, I've got to like have a default level of trust there in like their taste and where they go. So I think Naval is a really interesting kind of bridge for me as being like really, really interested in technology in the future and where things are going. Um, but also respecting like the rigor and the process of like using a bunch of different mental models and being interested in a bunch of different things. Um, Munger's not super technology focused and never has been, and, um, wouldn't probably be that way, even if he were our contemporary of Naval's or of mine, um, he's just much more drawn to kind of like the the value investing approach and the state ideas and things like that um i think where people maybe what people miss about munger now that they see his more conservative side of this he was very aggressive when he was younger and took like some really big bets levered bets um you know he he like made his first money in real estate he like went all in on a few kind of like arbitrage deals when he was early in order to like get enough sort of uh financial independence to like continue to invest more and more um and i know naval has like had to work really hard to get that first kind of um capital infusion or for you few capital infusions to like then become an investor and continue along the path towards like ever greater leverage right um so there's definitely um more similarities than people think but also like some huge differences that that are good and um I mean, when the world is changing so fast, like it definitely pays to pay some attention to what's changing and how it's changing. Part of my prep for this specific podcast was I went back and I went through my notes from when I read the book. So I have a collection of Navalisms here. I kind of want to run by you and get your take on cool. them. Yeah, let's do um, it. But, but before we get into some of the ones that stuck with me, I'm curious, besides leverage, because we'll talk about leverage here in a minute, what are some of the novelisms that stuck with you the most or the ones that kind of hit you in the face the most when you were putting the book together? Mm. Um, I mean, it's it was weird to spend this much time with these ideas because I like, just kind of like, kept getting hit in the face over and over again. Um, 
and some of them like weirdly even when you read them a few times like it's still tough medicine to take over and over again um i mean one that's one that really helps is like if you're not willing to work with people for life don't work with them for a day um it's truly hard to internalize the fact that life is short and that you shouldn't do anything that you're not willing to do forever. Um, you know, that's a tough prescription. Um, another is, I mean, it's a very basic idea, but like nothing, everything that's happening inside your head is like subject to your control. Um, and there are no external factors that are affecting your happiness. And that's, again, it, for the first time you hear that idea, if you haven't encountered it before, or if you, are a certain kind of person. It's almost impossible to like actually grok that. Um, but it's a foundation of so many good things um, that is really worth sitting with for a while, I think. Let's kind of start there as happiness as a skill. Mm -hmm. What are what are some ways we can develop that skill of happiness? Yeah, I, I think um, he says both happiness is a skill and happiness is a choice. I think skill is a much better way to think about it because choice seems to imply that you should just be able to like snap your fingers and be happy um where skill like anything else it has to be learned it has to be practiced it has to be um you have to take a disciplined approach to it and you have to earn it um i think that's it's a little strange to say that you have to earn happiness um but it's hard work and it's uh you know the same way that like fitness is earned um you have to pay attention to it. And if you take the path of least resistance, um, that's almost always like blaming something or someone else. And that's the short term um, way to think about something. And you're like giving up your agency, you're giving up control over it, and you're letting the external world affect your happiness. If you take the tough road of reframing that or recontextualizing it or finding a positive thing about it, um, you know, if you, if you choose to fight to have happy thoughts, um, you get better at it and it happens faster and it happens easier. Um, but it's hard work to build that skill. But if you have happy thoughts, you become a happy person. You become appreciative and generous and um, grateful. How do you catch your, like it's, how do you catch yourself when you have those unhappy thoughts? Cause I feel like the inner dialogue that people have with themselves can often be the most negative dialogue they have period. So how do you go about catching yourself in those moments? Uh, I think it helps to surround yourself with other people who are happy like you, you become like the people you're around the most right so if you become like people who interpret things positively uh or if you stay around people who interpret things positively and say positive things about others um you'll kind of naturally gravitate towards that i think another is to externalize that right to your point like it's hard to audit your own internal dialogue. Um, it just kind of like chases itself around and echoes around in your head. Um, but as soon as you're writing, you start to like catch that or as soon as you're even speaking out loud, like whatever, you know, whatever is easy for you, um, or whatever comes naturally. But as soon as you're writing, it's harder to lie to yourself. It's harder to like, you know, put down a complaint and not see that you're just like whining about something that's like not actually worth whining about or choosing to be unhappy about. And it becomes easier to like give yourself advice almost. Yeah. I found that just like even doing some morning pages and stuff. Like it's very mm -hmm. easy to kind of, to catch yourself on that. It's easy to underestimate, man. Like you, like as soon as you do it, you're like, Oh, I don't need to write it down. Like what's the difference between writing it and thinking it. And then as soon as you write it, you're like, Oh, so much better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. But speaking of kind of the people you surround yourself with, Another my ball is my have here. When working, surround yourself with people more successful than you. When playing, surround yourself with people happier than you. Shouldn't you strive for that person or those people you surround yourself with to be the same? Like, should they both be people that are more successful and people that are happier than you? I think that's the ideal. Um, you know, for, with with both. Um, you know, it's sometimes hard to find. Like, sometimes the most successful people are the least happy. Um, and then that's a question of like, are you willing to go to work with a bunch of people who are successful, but unhappy and then like run away from them when you're, it's time to switch gears. Um, I wonder, yeah, uh, I think that's an older quote and I actually wonder if he would change that now, um, to like, it's not worth being around people that make you, even if they make you successful, if they're making you unhappy, um, because it's hard to separate that, you know, your, your work and your home lives, those, those ideas as negativity, like works its way into your head regardless of the context. 
my, this next one, this next question I have here, I think kind of writing it down, I even think I misconstrued the meaning of wealth, but I have, how do you balance wealth and happiness? Hmm. Yeah. What's the, what's the like context for that? I, cause I think we're reading this back now. Cause I kind of, when I, when I write these questions, sometimes it's just stream of consciousness and they just kind of fall out of me. But I think I was misconstruing wealth with money as opposed to just building wealth. So can you kind of, how does Naval look at the difference between wealth and money? Let's look at, let's just, let's reframe it to that. Yeah. I think, um, you know, he says pretty early on in the, in the, how to get rich section, like having wealth is having assets that earn while you sleep. Um, and money is just how we symbolize and trade like value between. So if, if you were like pursuing money directly, um, you're probably going to be making the wrong moves. Um, similarly to if you're pursuing status directly, you're probably going to be making the wrong moves. Um, and what you want to think about is how to accumulate wealth. Um, that could be, it's, it's almost always, um, he says like equity in a business. So, uh, or producing assets that earn money while you sleep. So either owning a bunch of real estate, owning a bunch of stock market index is a way to get a bunch of equity. Working at a startup where you're granted shares, starting your own business is a way to get business equity. Um, but those are like where the big results come from almost universally. And then growing those and diversifying those to the point where like, it doesn't matter, you know, how much work you do in particular that day. It matters whether your assets are working on your behalf. And that eventually will come to determine the vast majority of your income if you're playing that game the right way. Play long-term games with long-term people is the next one. How, what long-term games are you personally playing like right now? Like how does that, what does that look like in practice for you? Yeah, um, I try to not do anything anymore that doesn't, that doesn't compound. Like that's how I think about the long-term games, right? So, um, you know, if I write a book and put it up for sale, like that book is going to be for sale 40 years from now. Um, if I, I'm finding out now if a course is the same way, like I think it is and I hope it is, but it's a little bit of a different mechanism. Um, you know, if I, if I create a blog post or record a podcast, like those things may be around for a long time, maybe less if like there's platform changes or whatever. Um, but I kind of allocate my effort by how long I think that thing is going to be around. And I try to have a really long-term view. I try to like, you know, my investment criteria is like, I try to never buy anything. I'm going to want to sell. Like if you buy something to sell, you're now all of a sudden you have to pay attention to it and figure out when to jump off the carousel. If you want to buy it and just wait for it forever and hand it off to my kids someday, like that's one decision and you forget about it. And then you just get happy that you made it and you can focus on other things. Um, so th just thinking long-term, doing things that compound, um, contributing to projects that are, that are permanent, um, or that have some permanent edifice to them. That's kind of how I end up living that. And how do you find long-term people? I think long-term people are, they're always honest. Um, cause it's always a short term short termism thing to like deceive someone into because they're going to figure it out. Um, it is a long-term thing to be extremely fair and put others first. Um, you can usually recognize when other people are, are thinking long-term. Um, you know, if you, if you see somebody starting a company, then they're like, I want to, I want to build this company forever. I'm planning. I have a 20 year vision for this thing. I have a 40 year vision for this thing. You know, I'm buying, properties with no intention of ever selling them um versus somebody who's like oh there's a pandemic i'm gonna go like spin up a mask company on shopify or whatever real quick you're like that's not like as a different we have different mindsets right um <laughs> not to i don't begrudge that game but like we're playing different games yeah and the next one kind of similar not similar to the game you're playing it's play stupid games win stupid prizes how, like obviously no one tries to set out to play a stupid game, but how do we know when we're playing one? Yeah, that's um th probably the less or the non-judgmental version of that is like play authentic games, win authentic prizes or um, whatever's important to you, right? Like you're writing screenplays so that you can like get a movie made. Like that's fucking awesome. If If it's not important to somebody else and like they're doing it because 
you know, they grew up in LA and they know somebody else is doing it. And then they think that's like exciting and what they're supposed to be doing. Um, that's wrong. Maybe, maybe they like are trying to get a movie made, but they're running around like trying to get coffee with, you know, some famous person when like, that's not the game. They need to be like working on their craft and writing a better screenplay. Right. Um, so I think it's, it's a matter of like understanding yourself well enough to know what you want and being sure that you're working on that. And I mean, like we talked about, like, you know, with, with wealth and status and money, like you can spend a long time chasing the wrong thing, thinking that those conflating, you know, if I have, if I have 50,000 Twitter followers, like it'll be, I'll be able to make whatever amount of money I want. And like, that's not true. Um, Like if what you want is the, the wealth, the assets, like there's more focused ways you can, you can do that. Um, If you want the status, then like, by all means, pursue the status. Um, But know that that's what you're doing and, and try to like isolate that and go after it. Arm yourself with specific knowledge. I think that's that's a big one as well for him. Like, what does specific knowledge mean? And is is does that, that's like are you in alignment with that, or should you, are you more of a generalist yourself personally? I I don't see a conflict between those two, right? Like, so there's specific specific knowledge is just. Um, how unique is your skill set, right? Like we're all, we're all unique um, as a byproduct of our, our genetics and our experience and all the crazy things that we've read and experienced as we like talked about earlier, right? Um, none of us is a perfect substitute for each other. We tend to have been trained mostly uniformly to do the same jobs, right? Like that is most of the system is like, go to law school, get a law degree, go get a job as a lawyer, like do a pretty uniform task. and the kind of doctrine of specific knowledge as Naval preaches is like the more unique you can become, the more valuable you are. So if you're a lawyer who deeply understands like Canadian, the Canadian medical system and some combination and the blockchain, like you'll end up incredibly valuable in the next 30 years because of your unique expertise, much more so than if you were just like a really good average lawyer. Um, And that really, like, I think as a generalist, like, no two generalists are exactly the same. They might use the same word to describe themselves as being a generalist. But if you sat down with them and started, like, plotting their actual skills and insights and experiences and things, like, they'd be very unique. And the longer they spend as a generalist and the more time they spend, the more unique they get. Um, And so I think think those two things are... um, almost the same like we, we are all generalists we all have specific knowledge and the more we the better we understand it and the more we develop it the more valuable we become um there's still plenty of work to do to like find you know find the right lock for that key that you've become and find the context that like applies your value um in, in, a, in a way that produces value for a ton of other people so that you can capture some of that value the, the other one the other novelism that i had that i wanted to get your opinion on was there are four ways to get lucky. And so I kind of copy and pasted. I took a big, long note about this, but I'll kind of summarize it. I pasted in here, but it's way too long to read. But when I read it kind of, and reading back and I kind of understand what I was going for, but when I looked at the four different types of luck, I almost looked at it as the four stages of luck. So the, the, the four, so for anyone that hasn't read the book yet, one, you should two, the four ways are hope luck finds you hustle until you're lucky, become good at identifying lucky situations and become the best at what you do and luck will find you. And so kind of my interpretation of that, like using it in the context of, we'll just say an athlete. So hope luck finds you is have some God given talent that you're just born with. And then hustle until you're lucky is using that talent and working every day to become better and better and better. And then by practicing every day you'll become luckier and luckier and then because you've been working for so long in games or whatever you'll be able to find those quote-unquote lucky situations because all the practice you've put in when you were hustling allows you to identify lucky situations other people wouldn't and then as you go better and better and, better and you keep getting better at being able to identify these lucky situations is when people start coming to you and so that was kind of how i interpreted the four ways to get lucky and i'm just curious if as someone who spent so much time kind of in naval's world does that make sense or am I just completely off in like left field here and that's, those aren't related? No, I think those, um, I don't think they were originally intended as a, as steps, as a ladder, but I think they're very correlated with, um, 
basically like the amount of time or reps or certainty that you have like into your specific knowledge, right? Like you, you just can't be born into type four luck. Um, you have to like learn and earn your way into it. Um, and I think you will, you can progress through those, um, with, with effort and attention. And it's helpful really to know, you know, as a, as a young person or any person that there is another step there and what it might look like. Um, it doesn't mean you can skip straight to it, but it means you at least know that there's something to continue to evolve into. And so the final novelism I'll ask you about, which I think is probably the biggest, just from an outside perspective, the biggest one that you took away was, was leverage. And so for anyone that's unfamiliar, can you kind of explain exactly what leverage is? Yeah, this is, um, it very, it's a little bit, um, intangible at first. So we're going to start with like the idea of a lever in physics is this like simple machine, right? And if you can, if you had a lever arm, that's two times longer on one side and you push down, it means you can move something shockingly heavy on the other side. And so a single person can move an 800 pound weight off the ground or tip it over a car with like a 20 foot lever. And, you know, the extreme version of this is like, I think it's like a 15 mile long lever, like you could lift up the Eiffel Tower. And like, this is the Archimedes quote, but like, it's just math. It's like, it's just like compounding is kind of like a simple idea that over a long period of time, a small amount of money can become a shockingly huge amount of money along with a long lever, a single, you know, hour of effort can become an incredible amount of money or incredible amount of impact or incredible uh, reach. And there's a lot of different types of levers and the levers that we have in like modern society are getting longer and longer. So it used to be that in order to reach a hundred thousand people, you'd have to like collect a ton of people in town halls or visit a hundred towns. And now is that we can record one podcast and tweet it and a hundred thousand people can listen to this. Um, you can write one, like software is an incredible version of this. So you can write one program, one set of rules, and it can execute 24 seven for years at a time for pennies. And there's, there's individual software programs now that are producing like hundreds of millions of dollars of value. And like, that's leverage that comes from just the building, encoding like one set of rules into a program that can run. And so the mindset behind leverage is just how do you seek out and find these very asymmetric opportunities? Like where can you spend, you know, 10 or a hundred hours working on a project that is going to go work for thousands or tens of thousands of hours on your behalf. Um, you know, I've, I've created this one book and now hundreds of thousands of people have read it at their own time and place and choosing. And that's truly wild. It's truly wild. Um, and so when Naval says like, this is the age of leverage, like the things that we are experiencing are the product of these levers. And when we see, you know, somebody earning tens or hundreds of millions of dollars a year, and we're like, how is that even possible? Like that, that shock comes from a linear mindset where we don't understand that that person is just working with a huge amount of leverage and they're having massive impact because of the influence that they're able to have and the resource allocations decisions that they're making. And so you've decided to build the course of leverage and community as well, course and community, building a mountain of levers. How do you teach leverage? What is this, what is the course going to look like? Yeah. So this, it really starts with a mindset, right? So it starts with like showing this mental model, starting from first principles and getting through like, what does it actually feel like to apply that in different situations? How do you make it tangible? Um, and then taking that idea and making it applicable. So whatever you're working on, there is a way to build leverage doing it, whatever your job is. Um, and through that, you can figure out, you, you start to apply these like frameworks that we give you, right? So like, are you solving this problem in a leverage way? Is it worth it to solve this problem in a leverage way? If you can, what are the resources that you have already at your disposal to put against it? If you don't already have resources, what is worth like budgeting for this opportunity? How big could it get? Um, what's the cost that it could support? And then starting to get an idea of like, what's your personal mountain of levers look like, right? Like if you've got, you've got 
a few things to get done and you've got like a few resources to do it, how can you best apply those resources in your time and your attention to get those things done? And then how do you do the work of adding more levers? How do you do the work of extending the levers that you have so that next year or the year after that, when you make the same move, you know, you spend the same hour of effort, you're having 10 times the impact, 10 times the reach, 100 times the impact, 100 times the reach. And most of these forms like extend and compound at relatively low cost. Um, so we have a lot of people who are kind of trying to like, you know, they're like, man, I got a family and a job and a side hustle. And like, I just do not know how to get all of the stuff that I want to get done, done. Um, and it's like, okay, well, if you can only spend, you know, four hours and 400 bucks this week on this project that you have a huge vision for, what's the high leverage thing that you can do that will start to work on your behalf? How do you do the work that gets more work done? Um, and we've got frameworks for this, we've got examples for this, and then we can break it all down into kind of like tools um, and show all the different types of leverage and give you this map so that you can lay out everything that you've got and what are your opportunities, where are your challenges and where are your bottlenecks. Um, and then the community sort of comes together to kind of support each other and help out. We've got the software engineers and doctors and venture capitalists and everybody's kind of like brings their own expertise to this. Um, and so we start to capture these really interesting case studies of like, well, this person figured out something really incredible, some really incredible way to automate their content creation and distribution and somebody else. Oh, that's incredibly helpful. Like I, I want to kind of take that system and apply it to my life. And somebody else is like, well, I've figured out how to, um, systematize all of our families, like grocery ordering and cooking. And it's like, it's very, it's a very different domain, right? It's all like just my personal life but that buys them back three or four hours a week that they can then put into quality time with their family or, you know, their, the business that they're trying to build or whatever it is. Um, so it's a very eclectic group, but it's a lot of fun to see what, what like comes up from there. And so the course isn't necessarily teaching, like apply, like do this to gain leverage. It's giving people the proper mindset to identify the areas of leverage within their own lives and how they then deploy that mindset to create all that leverage. There's, there's definitely some tactical stuff. So like the, we start with mindset and framework and then tactics kind of come out of that. But the world of tactics is so broad that it's impossible to kind of like get all the way into the detail. And so that's where we lean on the community to say like, we all, we are all like, I see the role of the course actually in establishing like the shared language and the shared frameworks and the shared um, kind of understanding of like what we're all trying to do and the tools that are available to us to do it. But then the strict tactics of like, you know, tool to specific context in your life is really like so infinitely big um, that we just kind of collect examples and components and the community like solves sort of helping each other out um, and finding like new inspiration and new examples through what everybody else is working on. And so is the course out now? Are you running with a beta group or something at the moment? Or what? when's like, what's the status of the course? The course is, it's been in beta for maybe two months now. Um, it is like, it's weird to say this on a podcast, but it's like quietly launched. Um, like it, we're, we're building slowly and steadily. And like, I don't want to have like a big bang launch. I just want to kind of like start I keep talking to people who are interested in these ideas and attracted to this community. And if they're the right fit for it, have them join and come along. Um, I've very much designed this to be super flexible and available to anybody in the world. So we don't have like a kickoff date and an end date and anything required. Like the course material is all self-serve. The small sort of study groups are asynchronous and with the community is like sort of flexible opt in opt out. So I want this to be available for you when it's applicable for you and never be, you know, a burden or onerous or stressful. Um, so yeah, if you're, if you're interested, there's, um, ejorgensen.com slash leverage. You can start to read about it. I've got, you know, tweet threads and blog posts and stuff about more about the concept of leverage and how to kind of get your head around it and whether it's applicable for you and what you're interested in doing at the time. And, whether it's the right solution for the challenges that you've got. But uh, yeah, if it is and you're interested, like you can DM me or email me or check out the site and read more about it. What's some of the early feedback been like from, from the students going through the course? It's really, um, it's been good in a way that's surprisingly diverse. Like there are people who totally grok this idea and they come in and they're like, I totally understand that this idea is important. and I 
don't know how to apply it. And like, I'm here to close the gap between idea and application in my life. Um, and they're like, I, I got this, I understood it to a two out of 10 and like, you've got me to a six out of 10. And now I feel like I'm on the path to the rest of it. Um, some people join and they're like, I, I sense that this is important, but I don't understand it. And I want your help to like flesh out this idea in my head and help me get started towards the path. Um, and some of those people are like, not even, you know, they're not, they're like very normal jobs. And they're like, I know I've seen what leveraged winning looks like and why some of my friends are like having these crazy outsized outcomes. And I don't really understand why. And like, that's, you know, like as I've started to find my way through this idea and through this book, like that, the more question I get is kind of like, I understand leverage is important, but I don't know what to do about it. Um, and I hope that this course is an answer to that. And I hope that the community um, brings together all these people who are either understanding that or trying to understand that and sort of build a new playbook almost for how to kind of use this new idea. Like, you know, Warren Buffett's Warren Buffett because he understood compounding at a very early age and leaned into it like an insane amount. And the people who are going to dominate the next decades and century are the people who are going to understand leverage and lean into it the most fully. Um, and I think, you know, you couldn't have said the age of leverage any better than, than Naval introduced us to it in the book. But um, if that's not already obvious, it's about to get a lot more obvious. And so what's kind of the long-term vision for the course? I, it's very, it's been very exciting to build a course because I love online education. I love education generally. Um, and so I like, you know, in the same way that like I was excited to write a book and when I wrote it, I wanted to play with like the medium of a book. I wanted to play with the medium of a course too. Um, and so I think we have all these amazing tools, you know, through video and audio and graphics and stuff to like build this transformative educational experience. Um, and I think we can really thread a needle between like creating something that is flexible and universally accessible and, and evergreen, right? Like I think these ideas are really, are, are very evergreen and can be useful for people in, in five years, just as they are today. So I wanted this course to be so I have like that book ethos to it, right? Like I, in the same way that you'll pick up that same book in five years and like still get something new out of it. I want people to revisit the course in five years and still get something new out of it and still be applying those ideas and hopefully still be friends with the people they met in there and still have that like alumni group working together to kind of like coach each other and learn from each other and continue to build these things. Um, and I hope that we can find this kind of sweet spot between you know, some of these, some of the lower price courses are just like lonely, flat experiences. You know, you're just kind of like watching videos and like working hard by yourself. And like, it's better than not getting access to that incredible material. Um, but it's not quite the same experience. And some of the really expensive high end courses are like going to college online. And it's like, as a really pricey, this better be like, totally life changing. Um, and so I think what we can do is find this like sweet spot where you know, for a few hundred bucks, we are introducing people to a community and new friendships and a new system of thought and giving them access to this really valuable material that we can continue to reinvest in and develop. And so I think in a few years, we'll have, you know, a community of thousands of people, this robust library, um, we'll continue to upgrade the like, case studies and the level of quality of the content and the professionalism and the sort of, um, polish you know like the production quality of the of the media um i'm just really excited to like see what it turns into um and i think i think like the community that we're attracting so far has been super super exciting and i got to meet such fun people and they're all excited to get to know each other and yeah it's it's very um it's very fulfilling but it's my, it's my first course and i'm really um thrilled to be like able to kind of put that out there and like play with this. It's, but it's like a living lab, right? It's like changing every day, which is it's so much different from working on the book. How often do you reflect on everything, the whole journey from that, from that guy who was buying bamboo t-shirts on Alibaba all the way to now with the published book, your own course, like how often do you reflect on just this whole journey that you've been on? Um, every time I'm on a podcast and somebody asks me how often I reflect on it, uh, 
No, I'm probably probably less often than I should. Um, you know, there's kind of these like milestone moments where you like launch a book and stuff, but there's usually in the middle of like a logistical maelstrom. And so like, you don't have a lot of time to like think back on it. Um, and so it's kind of cool. I mean, like to have started so started early with this story and like come up through it. Um, I mean, usually when I'm writing, I'm kind of like mining my past and my past experiences for, you know, some of the stuff that, that you ask about, like, you know, um, how to tie those past experiences to who we are now and how we solve problems and what we value. Um, and I, writing has been a really interesting practice for me to kind of learn some of that stuff. Um, sounds like for, for you too. A hundred percent. For my last question. I like to flip the script a little bit. So instead of me asking the question, it's you asking the question, but it's not to me. So pretend you have a crystal ball. You can ask this crystal ball any question. You'll get the 100% honest answer. What is one question you want to know the answer to? Mm. I want to know when humanity is going to encounter another species, another like life's life force outside of Earth. All right. I want to know no. if that happens. Does that happen in like year... 2200 does that happen in like year 10,000 does it never happen like I think so many so many things I think that'd be a very interesting answer to hear 100% and I can't believe that no one's asked that question yet like I've been doing this podcast for almost three years now I've been asking that question in that way mm. for the last three years but like I'm at least two years I think and no one's asked that specific question so I always like when I get a new answer to that I mean imagine imagine asking it like are there aliens and getting like, yes, and not getting another question. Like mm. that'd be devastating. Like I want to at least, I don't know. I, there's. That's, that's kind of why I say just the one question. Cause it puts constraints on it, you know, and it's usually like, I try to come up with like, it's just, it's just an interesting question. It's trying to my unique podcast ender, but I don't want to steal like Tim Ferriss's if you have a billboard or anything. So I just came up. That's the one I came up with. Was I put that constraint? Just the one I like question. that one. That's a good one. I'm going to, I'm going to take Thank that you. to a dinner party. I like it. Let me know what some of the answers you get are. If you do, I'm curious. Cool. If you figure out when we encounter aliens, let me know. I will for sure. <laughs> but no, man, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on this marathon episode of the podcast. Where can the people find you? I know you mentioned earlier, but I'd like you to plug it again, plug anything and everything you got right now. I'm, I'm really easy to find on Twitter at Eric Jorgensen. Um, and my personal site is ejorgensen.com. Awesome. Well, I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below so people can find it. I want to thank you once again for taking time to be on the podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening, whether you've listened the entire way through or you only listen to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and follow Eric. Go and check out his course. I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below, like I said. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me everywhere on social media at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. As always, today's podcast is powered by True Band. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon. Do me a favor and review this podcast for Jacob. My DMs are also open. His intro, his outro is better than mine.